Welcome everybody to today's Edna Anderson Taylor Communication Institute lecture by our colleague, Dr. Chris Ingram. I'm introducing Chris today and moderating the Q&A at the end because the director of the Comm Institute, Sean Lawson, is homesick, or so he says. <laughs> Dr. Ingram is Associate Professor of Communication here at the U and our new Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Communication. On the core faculty of the U's Environmental Humanities Graduate Program, as well as a faculty affiliate with the Global Change and Sustainability Center. Dr. Ingram's work engages with a range of areas from across the humanities, including media aesthetics, environmental communication, and rhetorical theory. He has invested in critical approaches to the material, aesthetic, and affective practices that configure the environments we create and inhabit. He has published numerous articles and book chapters, as well as three books on these subjects. His books include Lego Fight, Building Blocks as Media, published by Bloomsbury in 2020, Gestures of Concern, published in 2020 by Duke University Press, and after a few short years off, Rhetorical Climatology, which will be published this coming fall. Before joining our faculty, Dr. Ingram completed a post as Fulbright Scholar in Digital Culture at the University of Bergen in Norway, and in 2021, he was named a rising star in the humanities at the University of Utah. And finally, one note before I hand things over to Chris, please plan to join us on March 23rd at 3 p.m. for the next lecture in this semester series. Dr. Brandon Valeriano, a political scientist, distinguished senior fellow at the Marine Corps University, and senior advisor to the Congressional Cyberspace Solarium Commission, will provide a one-year retrospective and analysis of the role of cyber and information operations in the Russia and Ukraine war. And with that, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Chris Ingram. Thanks everybody for coming out. I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk with you about this work I'm doing. Um, so I'll just jump right into it. I, when Sean told me I had an hour and a half, that felt like so much time. So the slideshow kind of expanded a little bit. So uh, we'll just see where we get and, uh, and chat through this stuff, okay? So uh, this, I wanted to start with, with this image and see if anybody has any idea what it is. I mean a duck, right? But <laughs> Any, I thought some people might know, but what this is, is the first Lego toy. Oh. So Lego was started uh, by a Danish man named Ole Kirk Christensen, and he was a carpenter, and he, so he built furniture, beds, chairs, so forth. Uh, then the Depression hits in the 30s, and uh, he needs a way to practice more uh, austerity. So he takes the scraps from his furniture and he starts making smaller things. Uh, he starts making little ducks that you could pull with a rope. He makes yo-yos, he makes blocks. Uh, and eventually, uh, this, this, these wooden toys uh, became more popular than his furniture. And so he shifted away from the furniture and said, let's just make these toys. And the blocks were the most popular. So he began making these wooden blocks. Uh, and over time, uh, that shifted into, of course, the plastic blocks that you know today that uh, are, as we'll see today, uh, an exemplification of modularity as a kind of structure. So this phrase, that betster er ikke for gut, means uh, only the best is good enough. And that was sort of the motto of the Lego company. Uh, so as Mike mentioned, I, I did a book a few years back on uh, Lego and sort of the world building power of Lego. And so, uh, <coughs> This work is kind of something that came out of that, uh, but didn't show up in that project, and so it's something I've been working on since. So uh, one thing we get from, from Lego uh, in the form that we know them today is that they're uh, a technology that can be used to make different things than to take them apart and remake something else, right? So uh, there's a versatility to that structure uh, that allows for uh, a lot of growth, uh, a lot of uh, possibility for what can happen. So uh, Lego uses this. This is just a, a recent branding campaign. Uh, they said, Lego, rebuild the world. And the idea is that this is a worlding technology, a technology that allows us to sort of harness our inner hero and express our superpower through an act of creation. And they like to show this number a lot. 
Guessing nobody has any idea what this number is, so I'll go ahead and just tell you. Uh, this is the number of different discrete builds that you can get from combining uh, from six two by four bricks. So that's a lot. Now that's just with six bricks uh, with eight studs on top. Obviously, you can imagine if you have more than six bricks, that's going to exponentially rise. So if you have just a handful of Lego bricks, which you can hold more than six in a handful, there are billions of possibilities. So it really has this enormous capacity to imagine the creation of all different kinds of worlds. Now, I want to tell you a, kind of a, a couple stories here today. And one is, is about Lego. Another one uh, is about... Um, modularity as what I'm thinking of as a, as a structure of power. So the Lego story kind of begins, uh, I gave you sort of the historical origins of the company, but more recently they built this structure in Billund, which is in Denmark, and uh, that's the home of Lego where Lego started. Uh, this big structure, uh, what does it look like? A bunch of Lego bricks, right? <laughs> so this is called the Lego house. And just up the road from this, uh, is Legoland, which is, is their branded amusement park. Uh, now, the Lego house, there's a close, another close-up of it, uh, is, of course, designed to look like Lego. Uh, and when you go inside, uh, you get this cool little wristband that when you are leaving the facility after touring uh, all kinds of play spaces, and it's sort of, it's this wonderful place, different than an amusement park, more hands-on. Um, and this will spit out for you a customized build. So one of those 915 million possible builds. Uh, and then you'll walk over here to this uh, brick molding machine that on site will produce six bricks, which you will then uh, have your little sort of customized card to make your own personal build. So it's again part of this building the world mentality that LEGO produces uh, that is is hopeful and optimistic, you know, creates hope that anything's possible. Um, but what I think you also see is some basic principles of, of media studies here. Uh, if you go back to someone like Marshall McLuhan. So as you all know, I'm sure McLuhan uh, is, is sort of a, a provocateur in media studies. Uh, John Durham Peters says you read him for the fireworks, not for the scholarship. Uh, and that's a good way to sort of look at him, I think, because the, the provocateur nature of his work uh, forces us to ask different kinds of questions. So uh, rather than sort of subscribing wholesale with what he has to say, I think going in that spirit is a way to sort of think with McLuhan uh, into some of the questions that I'll be thinking through today. Uh, and one of his early contributions in understanding media uh, was to say that a light bulb is a media, is a medium. And it's a medium that doesn't have any content. Now, or rather, more specifically, the content of the light bulb and any medium is another medium. So when we think of media content, we tend to think of how something is represented on the screen and uh, what that depicts ideologically or in terms of uh, equity and so on. Uh, McLuhan's approach is a different sort of matter. He would say that the content of um, a film is a play or an opera or a book. And so there's this nested nature uh, in media where the content is nested one after another. So that's the sort of sense of content we're thinking if we think about a Lego brick. Because a Lego brick can be modulated uh, to create any number of possible things in terms of its representational value. So here's provocateur uh, McLuhan. Uh, and an illustration of this sort of maxim of his, the content of any, any medium is another medium. If you take the sun or take um, a lightning bolt that starts a fire. Uh, you take, then you have humans developing the power of, of fire with a torch, uh, and then maybe harnessing into a candle, <coughs> and eventually you get electricity. Each one of these is nested in a different sort of te technology or medium uh, that ultimately is somewhat elemental or natural. So the sun, lightning, natural elemental forms of medium that, that get repurposed and re resituated. Uh, in subsequent uh, media forms. So uh, this structure uh, is also something that you can see in, oh, so then you get like a flashlight even. 
Um, <laughs> and the flashlight, don't forget that. Uh, so there's a kind of franchise logic that you get with uh, the Lego group and that you get in this kind of nested structure of, um, of media as, co as the content being another form of medium. Now, a, a good example of, the, of like a franchise is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? So it begins with uh, comic books. Uh, then you have, I don't know how well you can see it. This is, uh, you know, all the different Marvel movies and spin-offs that you can get on, what is it, Disney Plus now. And uh, those, of course, are the content of them is the comic book. But then you get uh, spin-off toys, right? Content of those, the movies, which were the content of the comic book, so on. Then you get uh, like an amusement park at, in Disneyland or whatever it's called, the California Adventure. And uh, you see how this branding and this sort of horizontal movement of uh, this, some, this franchise or this idea or this concept uh, can spread out uh, hypothetically in a kind of infinite sort of way. Now, um, in Derek Johnson's book, Media Franchising, uh, he, he talks about kind of one of the tensions or things that uh, any sort of franchise needs to balance uh, is the past and the future. So this idea that we have this old tradition of comic books and uh, now we have an amusement park. There are some people who go back to uh, a franchise or a certain type of content because it's familiar to them. It's easy to them. They already uh, appreciate it. They know the characters. They know the universe. They know the sort of style and the language. Uh, at the same time, so things don't get stale, they need to be providing new content. So you have to balance this past or familiarity uh, with novelty, with something new. So uh, there's this sense where you can't get too far removed from the core storylines, but you have to offer expansive worlds so that people continue to be invested in something that's not just the same old wineskins uh, or wine in different wineskins, right? Um, so uh, this sort of structure becomes kind of important when we go back to thinking about Lego. So Lego, of course, also franchises its, its products. There's Lego video games, there's Lego toys, there's Lego builds, of course, and so on, uh, amusement parks, the works. Uh, but just as a couple of illustrations of that, so um, we saw that there's a Lego house. They also have a Lego house set. Uh, remember we saw inside the Lego house, there's a machine that spits out custom-made bricks. We also have a, machine, a, a set of the brick molding machine. And a little close-up of this set is this little part we're going to see a close-up of. Or there's the set close up. Uh, you get even the little bag of bricks is now a single brick. So it continues to sort of grow on. And so we're not just getting this lateral movement across uh, so comic book, movie, amusement park, and so on. We're getting this almost a vertical movement where you're getting more and more particularized within this particular uh, medium. Uh, you also get a set that actually you build a, a two by four brick. <laughs> you get uh, desk drawers that are two by four bricks. If you don't like the drawer model, you get a box that you can lift off the top and do the same thing. So in all of these cases, it's the same sort of structure that is a modular structure that can accommodate <laughs> ultimate or sort of endless repurposing uh, and repetition of, of a certain kind of form. Now. This all, the way I've been talking about this and the way I tend to approach what I think of as media studies is from this materialist standpoint. We're looking at the materiality of these things, which is a different way of approaching it than looking at the content uh, in the form of sort of its representational value. Uh, just a different way of doing it. Uh, so we're back to this number. Uh, you can see that uh, this sort of allows for this kind of meta nature of it. Has anyone seen the Lego movies? So if you recall from the movies, uh, the, the, just a sort of general, yeah, the people with kids have maybe seen them. Uh, uh, the, 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 the general plot of the first movie, anyway, is that they have to save the universe from the ultimate weapon of destruction, which is super glue. And so they have to put the super glue, glue cap back onto the super glue 
That's the whole mission of the movie. Because super glue represents the fixity of things instead of change is constant. And if you have the fixity of things, then the possibility to rebuild worlds isn't there. And if you don't have that possibility to rebuild worlds, you lose that lateral, mod, that lateral sense of modularity as sort of franchise growth, and you lose that vertical sense where it's nested one in another, uh, of Lego, then the smaller Lego, smaller Lego, sort of the Matryoshka doll uh, version of that. And so you get this sort of like snake eating its tail kind of thing going on with some of these, tech, with some of these franchises or, or products where um, they, they can't escape their own ecosystem because that ecosystem is itself so capable of accommodating any others. So now I want to talk a little more specifically about modularity. So, oh, one more thing before I get there. Uh, this is a gift that the Lego company gives out to its employees after they've been there for a while. Just to illustrate the power of that sort of corporate story of the six bricks. Uh, so they're really leaning into this. This is, this is like the watch you would get after being with the company for 25 years. You get like six bricks or something. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I want to tell a parable. And it's, it's not my parable. It's a parable uh, that Herb Simons tells in a really important article from 1962 called The Architecture of Complexity. So uh, Simons went on to win a Turing Award. He got a Nobel Prize, like really smart person. And... Uh, he wrote an article um, about modularity. Uh, and his basic argument is that complexity frequently takes the form of hierarchy and that hierarchic systems have some common properties that are independent of their specific content. Okay, so what's he talking about? Interestingly, if you look at research on modularity, it's almost always in systems design literature or business literature. Uh, but Simons is talking about a whole sort of structure of thinking uh, that is capable of accommodating all kinds of features that are complex uh, but marked by hierarchical principles. So let me give an example, and this is the parable that he tells. In his parable, uh, there are two watchmakers. One is called Tempest. And Tempest approaches watchmaking. We're talking about the old uh, mechanical watches, which are going viral on TikTok nowadays, apparently. Uh, uh, and in, the, in Tempest's approach to watchmaking, he takes all the pieces, and he scatters them all out on the table, and he assembles them all. First piece one, first piece, then piece two, three, four, five. And uh, what ends up happening to Tempest is that this is very methodical, it's organized, it, it's sort of uh, one thing after another, you know, there are logical steps. At the same time, if what, something goes wrong, a whole thing falls apart and he's got to start back over at step one. Now, so Tempest is able to make really beautiful, successful watches, but the process is a little more painstaking because there are these sort of stops and starts. So this is an example of sort of a complex system for in Simon's sense. Uh, Hora, different watchmaker, takes a different approach. Hora builds the watches in components or modules. He will, first I'm gonna build the part that go, that's the watch face. Then I'm gonna build the part that turns the hours at hand. Then I'm gonna build the band or whatever it may be. And in that way, he makes a complex process more manageable uh, because he divides it up into separate modules so that if one fails, he's able to sort of fix that one without having to fix all the other ones. So Simon's conclusion is that Hora prospered while Tempest became poorer and poorer and finally lost his shop. So I'm, I'm so, I mean, I love this, the, the idea of putting a parable in, this, in a research paper. Uh, but uh, one of the really interesting things for me is that he's casting this in a language of sort of economics, right? It becomes less financially viable to produce something using a, a non-modular technology or, or technique uh, than to use a, a modular technique. Now, let's try to build from this parable uh, a sense of some general principles about modularity. So for Simons, it's a hierarchical structure, right? You can't just put all the pieces on the table at once. 
you have to assemble pieces in a certain order, and you have to assemble some cluster of pieces ahead of other clusters, or the whole thing doesn't work quite as well. For instance, part C might rely on uh, part B, so you have to go in a particular order. That order uh, speaks to a kind of hierarchy of importance in the building out uh, of something like a watch. But for Simons, Simons is not just talking about watchmaking. Watches are part of the parable. He says uh, modular systems and these hierarchical systems in particular uh, are found in all kinds of cultural things from watch, you know, the, the product of human inventions from watchmaking to the economy. Uh, economy operates through uh, modular thinking also. So you have different sectors, you have a uh, smaller form of economy, you have bigger form, you have longer scale, shorter scale, so on. But I said it's also natural, right? So you look at chemistry, you look at genetics, there are all kinds of hierarchies built into sort of uh, life on Earth. Now, one thing that he misses, though, is critiquing hierarchy or acknowledging that hierarchy is itself a human invention in the sense of a way to help us understand uh, the human relationship with the non-human uh, and a way to, uh, to sort of exert a kind of control uh, over uh, other species, over other people. Uh, think of like the great chain of being. One of, the, one of the lovely exercises that I love doing in my classes is I give students a list of a bunch of words like ape, tree, rock, god, man, woman, child, fish, and I say, put these in their proper order. <laughs> and they just, they, they, blow, they don't know what to do. Uh, so they end up putting them in some order. And I, I, I deliver, intentionally tell them, you know, I'm not going to give you any guidance. I'm mm -hmm. going to let you figure out what proper means. And then I, after they all put them in the order, uh, they do it in groups, they report back. And I say, well, now why did you put it in that order? And someone will say, well, God has to go on top because God created all things. Another person will say, well, man has to go above God because man created God. Another person will say, well, we got to put the tree on top uh, because trees are natural and, uh, and, and grow and like a rock can't grow. And so there's always, so, so the, the point of the exercise is to show that uh, value systems get sort of embedded into any way of, of sort of thinking about the relationship between different things. And what Simons is saying is that hierarchy is fundamental to complex systems and that modularity uh, is a material expression of hierarchy. So in other words, um, if you go back to something like the watches or the Lego bricks, you see that hierarchy isn't just a principle in the way you would see maybe on the great chain of being where you can hypothetically imagine God, and then the angels, and then people, and so on, uh, where it's, it's more removed. Here you're holding hierarchy in your hand with the, the way Lego bricks are constructed, with the pieces of the, uh, of the watch, and so forth. And this is what I'm thinking of as a structure of power, as sort of distinguished from a power structure. I might think of like capitalism as a power structure, or uh, anthropocentrism. And this sort of, you know, thinking divert, there's a ton of different sort of language to think about this, right? We have ideology, we have hegemony, we have all kinds of sort of power adjacent words, we have discourse, right? All different kinds of ways to think about it. But I want to distinguish a structure of power because the interesting part here is the structure. And, and that gets to speak to the materiality of it. So what aspects of modularity uh, provide a structure that then are associated with certain values about what's right and about what is um, most important uh, in terms of how we think about not just sort of our products like Lego or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, but our relationship to one another, including uh, to the non-human. Non so, uh, so yeah, this, that's why I just said not the same as a power structure. Um, so just sort of a quick uh, way of looking at some of the features of modularity as a structure of power. Uh, we'd want to say uh, there's a certain efficiency uh, that is, is valued in modular systems. Uh, think about Tempest versus Horus. Hora, or Hora. Hora was way more efficient. Uh, uh, and that 
created more value for Hora. He became more prosperous. Tempest's shop failed because he couldn't be very efficient. Uh, you see mutability. You can imagine this structure of building some parts and then building some other parts and combining those together. Uh, it doesn't have to apply just to Legos or to watchmaking. Uh, in the 60s and even now to some degree, modular architecture was a huge thing. Uh, and if, if you begin to see how, um, I've seen some of these stories in the news recently about how a lot of apartment buildings are looking exactly the same from city to city. Uh, that's because uh, they figured out how to make them efficient and to essentially modularize them so that uh, if you bought an apartment complex, or, or not a complex, but a build uh, apartment, you could customize it to some degree based on the modular features that you wanted or the floor plans that you wanted. So uh, that the mutability means it doesn't apply to just one thing, which is one of the reasons I don't think of it as sort of this uh, like a power structure, but a structure of power, because it's the structure that's of interest here. Uh, and another feature of, of, of modularity that I'm, I'm working with is this idea of endless growth. That uh, because you can keep building and building, you can theoretically anyway build forever. Get to that, go back to that Lego thing. Six bricks gets you 915 <coughs> million plus possibilities. Then you add one more and it just exponentially expands. Uh, so here we are having a fantasy of uh, no sort of, we're abandoning this teleological perspective on, on what's possible. And uh, I, I can't go too far into this. Uh, because I don't remember it well enough, but I do remember that uh, Marx talks about sort of uh, the abandonment of teleology uh, as one of the things that short, came, short changes are a possibility of like imagining your commons together because the expansiveness uh, uh, of sort of capital uh, sucks everything up in it. Uh, so Simon's article comes out in 1962, and if you look at a Google engram of the word modularity, it's right around then when modularity gets a lot more popular. And you get some uh, prominent architectural uh, innovations in, mod in modular building, particularly out of Japan, uh, and then uh, other different forms of that uh, in the States and elsewhere uh, that really see it, it kind of take off. So what I want to spend a little time arguing about now uh, is this idea that modularity as a material expression of hierarchy ends up re reinforcing a host of colonial uh, entitlements and anthropocentric assumptions. Uh, and that ends up miscasting modularity's worlding and unworlding capacities. So in other words, uh, I'm going to try to tease out or, or think through, and this is where maybe you can help me in the Q&A, uh, some of what I see as a tension between this beautiful ideal that we can build new worlds and anything is possible that modularity seems to offer, uh, and an acknowledgement that efficiency can be okay, or it can be a good thing, uh, at the same time that I do see this as a structure that, uh, that's very good at maintaining a status quo and maintaining power uh, it, that can be kind of uh, problematic. So uh, you don't have to read this. I put this up here to help me sort of remember what to say. Uh, this, I'm going to tell you another parable. So uh, let's imagine uh, that you were putting on uh, a big show and you want to showcase uh, everything that has ever been accomplished by humankind. The, or, or let's say 2023. The, you know, what's the best that human is, humankind has produced this year or like, the most innovative technologies? You want, to, you want to hear from everybody across the planet and you want to showcase this for the whole world to see. And, uh, you, you need to have some sort of venue for this. So you're going to build a building uh, or buildings or some sort of event where people can come and check it out and see, whoa, holy cow, did you see what they're doing? Did you see what they're doing? And really appreciate human ingenuity and so on. So how should the building be built? So this wasn't a hypothetical question, of course. This uh, is a question that was asked in 1851 uh, with the Great Exhibition. So uh, England uh, decided to host one of these world fairs, they're sometimes known as today, right? Uh, and invite uh, all the countries of the earth uh, to come participate. And they were going to build an enormous building to house sort of pavilions uh, from all the participating countries to showcase their innovation and, and 
commercial, essentially, ingenuity. So they took, uh, in the way, if we were building a monument or a building on campus or something, uh, we would offer people the chance to sort of submit their proposals for what it might look like. Uh, they did that. They got 245 um, submissions from architects to propose what the building uh, ought to be. They went through that. They had a committee of people that went through them. They couldn't agree on a single one. None of them seemed to work because this one was too expensive, or this one just wasn't going to be big enough, or this one was awesome but just impossible, like you can't actually build this thing, uh, or this one uh, was just going to have too big, was too big for the space. They were going to have this in Hyde Park. They ended up having this in Hyde Park uh, in central London. And uh, one other stipulation, other than some of the constraints of cost and size and so forth, uh, was that it needed to be temporary. They wanted this to be in London Central Hyde Park, uh, but they couldn't have it be there forever because the park was an important part of the locals' life, uh, and they thought it would take over too much of that uh, space. Uh, so it needed to be temporary. So now we have to have a temporary structure, uh, and uh, we have to have this enormous structure that can be uh, achieved in a very short time because uh, after you have this problem of none of these protocols quite working, now we get to a time crunch where this has got, we got to start construction immediately and so on. So they're under a real, this was like a big public PR mess at the time. So they looked everywhere for new people. And um, one of the people that came forward was this, this guy at the time, was just Joseph, Joseph Paxson, since gets knighted or served or whatever it is. Uh, now, Joseph Paxton. Uh, was uh, a botanist. And uh, he is, along with being involved in the Great Exhibition, uh, he, does anyone know what he's most famous for? He gives us the Cavendish banana, which is the variety of banana that you get at all the supermarkets now. He's the one who sort of <laughs> brought that over uh, and uh, worked with it to sort of get the features that are amenable to the, what we know of as a banana as opposed to like a smaller plantain or whatever. Uh, but in his work with plants, uh, he was in charge of a uh, of kind of a botanical gardens for uh, uh, the royal family. And uh, he discovered these enormous, not discovered, but he, he discovered that these enormous lily pads had remarkable properties. And uh, one of those properties is to be very large in size. Like, we're talking about as large as two of these tables combined. So really big uh, uh, diameter. And uh, they also were very strong. So you could, you could sit a child on them, and they could support a child's weight. So uh, in fact, um, they obviously don't have pictures of, of, of this. Well, I guess it's not obvious. They were photographs back then. Uh, but they apparently put uh, Paxton's kid on one of these as the queen was coming through to sort of show, uh, look at these, this is, this is really cool. And so then the queen sort of further supported their botanical gardens or so forth. Uh, but, but what Paxton realized was that, um, here's, a, here's what he says. He says, nature has provided the leaf, he's talking about the, the lily pad, uh, with longitudinal and transverse girders and supports that I, borrowing from it, have adopted in this building. So I, I can't make a claim about this being the first or whatever form of biophilic design, uh, but this is certainly an example of biophilic design, looking to the plant kingdom uh, as a way to think about how to build uh, structures for humans, essentially. So at the time, greenhouses were relatively ramshackle affairs, apparently, but he was able to design uh, you can see sort of the glass panes here. And he, that's him leaning over this huge uh, lily pad. Uh, and that's the underside that shows you sort of how it gets its strength between those transverse and lateral uh, parts. Uh, he was able to build a, a, a greenhouse uh, that was far superior to the ones that had been built before. Uh, and so he said, why don't I build just like a very big greenhouse for the Great Exhibition. And uh, you know, without many other better alternatives, uh, his proposal was accepted. So he proposes 
this enormous palace. And it's going to be made out of glass and iron girders uh, and some wood. And it's going to be constructed in a modular format. So a very self-consciously modular format. So let me try to just give you a sense of the scale of the Crystal Palace, because it's, it's really impressive. Um, so have you ever been in like, uh, this is an example that hits home for me, but uh, like, uh, like a really big gym that has like five basketball courts across it. And you see, whoa, that's a lot of basketball courts. You should see any, like, you're used to seeing like one or something. So you see like one of these big gyms. These are four, one, two, three, four, five, maybe basketball courts there. So that's a, that's a really big building. Uh, the Crystal Palace uh, was as long as the equivalent of 187 basketball courts. So you could be on one side and you couldn't see somebody on the other. That's how far, that's how big it was. So massive building. Uh, so uh, 92,000 some square meters, 20 acres, uh, 293 plus thousand glass panes, uh, 400 tons of glass. And this is what it took to create a structure this large that could literally, was the idea, house the entire planet, all the nations of the Earth which obviously it falls way short of that. And the whole enterprise, of course, is not just to sort of showcase everybody else's ingenuity, uh, but to establish the might and power of the British Empire uh, by showing we have the biggest. All the other creations really owe a debt to us because they are literally inside our, our pavilion, which is the Crystal Palace itself. And we want this to be very clear to the world, so the symbolism of it being clear is a lovely uh, irony too. Uh, in that um, you can see it from far away, you can see inside it, and so forth. So uh, I want to show you just some pictures of the Crystal Palace. A lot of them are sort of artistic rendering, some of them are photographs, but to give you a sense of, of what it looked like at the time. Uh, but first, let me uh, talk a little bit more about the modularity of this palace. So when we talk about uh, Lego, we think of the modularity in the sense that you can take a brick, put it on another, put another brick on, and make something. And then you can take a brick off and put a different brick on, and now you're maybe making something else. So you have these parts that you can put together and assemble and reassemble in different ways to create different things. Um, but those parts aren't just born in your living room, right? They go through a whole process of creation to get there. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that process later on. Uh, but for now, we can think of it uh, as just, well, I'll, we can think of them uh, as coming from a factory, basically. Uh, another example of sort of modularity is if everybody, anyone does a mise en place when they cook, right? They say, oh, I'm going to, here's my tomato, here's my pasta, here's my garlic, here's my chopped onion, right? And you have all the pieces right there, and then you can combine them together, and it makes it a lot easier than just, oh, no, where's this, and all that. It also takes a little more time. <laughs> Um, so, but in both cases, uh, the, the foods, the Lego bricks, uh, don't just appear. There's a whole process that gets them to you and makes them uh, operable. In other words, makes you capable of doing anything with them by virtue uh, of kind of an operational chain uh, that takes them, say, from the farm to, uh, onto a truck, onto a loading facility, onto an unloading facility, right into the supermarket, onto your, uh, into your grocery bag. Uh, and it's the same way with the Lego brick. I'll go into a little more detail with the Lego brick a little later. Uh, and this essentially requires a ton of infrastructure. So in, I, I mentioned McLuhan as sort of a, a person that I was thinking through uh, with the, my approach to media. Uh, Harold Innes is another one in this sort of Toronto School of Media Studies people who's really interested in uh, the materiality of media and so infrastructure in that sense becomes a salient thing when you're thinking about modularity because it's not just the brick but it's the whole modular process whereby the brick gets into your living room and becomes buildable to, to begin with. So um, all right let's get down to this some cool some pictures. So there's one I'll just go through I'm not going to try to narrate each of these I'll just show you some of these pictures of the Crystal Palace. I mean, look at that scale, that's massive. 
I guess I, I'll, I'll stop here because I think this is, illustrates the scale pretty well. Um, or maybe that one. Uh, that infrastructure was essential to making this thing possible. Uh, because you had to have places that could make certain types of type of glass. You had to get that glass to the site. You had to protect the glass so it didn't shatter. You had to get all the iron there. Uh, that couldn't all be produced in London, so you had to get it from other parts of the country. You had to have trains or canal systems that brought the stuff to you, right? And then you had to have uh, the capacity to make them upright and to move them and to install them. So the building process, so it's a modular building in the sense that things are prefabricated off-site and brought to the site and then refabricated or fabricated differently or sort of assembled differently. Uh, however, it would be mistaken to think that the modular process or that sort of structure of power uh, begins when you get all the stuff piled up in Hyde Park to be built. It's part of a, nut, a longer operational change that works through infrastructures that sort of stand under its, its, the possibility of its very being. And that becomes a key point later on when we get to something that I'll kind of think of as a, clusion, a conclusion. Uh, all right, uh, another interior shot or, or rendering of it. Um, some, some more artistic renderings. So you're seeing the, the space is massive, huge trees and so on. Uh, just a huge display of Britain's power. Uh, under the auspices of opening it up to all worlds. Right? You're gonna, uh, the, here's the, uh, the American pavilion. So look at what America can, do, America can do. But of course, who's making that possible for them? England. And what's making the England's or the British's display of might possible is this modularity. Without that, they couldn't have pulled this off. So uh, this is a kind of a pastiche. Someone took a, transposed one of these older photographs with uh, where the Crystal Palace is now. So little side note, um, as planned, they moved it off of Hyde Park uh, and then they reassembled it because you can take it apart and rebuild it uh, in a different park in London where it now is. Uh, it burned down a while ago and they've rebuilt it. Uh, but this is sort of a version of what the original one would look like in its current spot. Um, okay, so just to give you an idea of like how many people were at this thing, uh, some famous people, Darwin, Marx, Dickens, Bronte, Eliot, Carroll, Tennyson, Thackeray, are some of the famous people that I could track down that showed up to the, pal to the Great Exhibition. So not just like uh, everyday person, but these, these people that had some sort of high social standing uh, and influence. And so this was a very prominent event. And in addition to all the stuff that uh, I'm sure you're thinking about displaying the colonial might of Britain, I want to focus in on the, the, the way modularity uh, is a structure of that power that is indis indis indissociable uh, from its sort of colonialist uh, efforts uh, with the Great Exhibition. So let's think about some aspects of this structure of power. Uh, we've talked about them, them before, but efficiency. This building needed to be built, to, to be built quickly. It needed to be built uh, in a way that required minimal training from, from the people who were going to be building it. Because Paxson couldn't just build this thing by himself, right? Uh, it needed to be built in a way uh, that allowed uh, the parts to come from afar uh, and late subsequently to be moved somewhere different. Uh, and so uh, it also needed to be mutable. In other words, it needed to be adjustable uh, to uh, different uh, situations, to be put in a different park once the Great Exhibition was over. Uh, and it needed to be able to grow to accommodate space as more people signed up. So the timing of it, as I understand it, was it didn't have everybody signed up to participate uh, before they had finished the building. So they were sort of waiting to see, oh, we're going to build this other wing over here, and we can just keep adding on and adding on, uh, because that's what the structure of modularity allows. So all right, let's go back to the plants that are kind of at the heart of this, right? Because the very idea for this as a structure comes from uh, Paxton's inspiration from the lily plant. Now, this is just something that I pulled from uh, 
sort of a scientific uh, text on, on what modular organisms are. Uh, so uh, an organism in which the zygote develops into a discrete unit, which then produces more units like itself, rather than developing into a complete organism. So you can think of uh, some plants, uh, fungi, sponges, corals, as modular organisms. So if you cut off one little sort of branch of a, a, a coral plant, it can, it can stay alive. Um, think about uh, a tree, for example. If you cut off the branch of a tree, uh, the tree uh, trunk still stands, the tree still lives, right? It's structured in a, in a, it, it structured in a modular way, uh, which is very different structure than, say, a human being or many, many other animals. Uh, if we were to lose an arm, our arm's not going to grow back, and maybe the tree's arm's not going to grow back either. Maybe, uh, certainly, uh, cutting off a limb of a tree can be catastrophic enough that it ruins the tree. However, uh, if you uh, were to sort of decapitate a person, uh, it would be a different story, right? Because we are not built in a modular way, right? We have these key organs, like a heart, our lungs, our brain, and so forth, uh, without which we're kaput. Uh, this, the distribution of uh, being in a modular organism changes that in such a way uh, that you can take a loss and you can repurpose yourself in different ways depending on the needs of that, that organism relative to its environment. So uh, I want to sort of go in a little further detail uh, before stopping here. Um, about what I promised about that on that slide about the sort of operational chain. So uh, this is a Lego mold. So the most closely kept secret in the Lego world is the, is the nature of their, um, their molds. They, they pride themselves on this because they are exact within like a remarkable uh, level of precision. Uh, so, uh, in the 90s, Lego lost a huge lawsuit. Uh, maybe a bit more recently than that, but Lego lo lost a huge lawsuit uh, about their, uh, their rights to have their bricks uh, be only within the Lego ecosystem. So a Lego brick will always be stamped with the words Lego on top. And you have like Mega Blocks and Roblox and other competitors uh, that because they won the lawsuit against Lego, now uh, it's recognized that any bricks allowed, any companies allowed to make a brick that can be compatible with a Lego brick. And that changed, that's when Lego started making movies, started making video games, started really spreading out their franchise because they lost the ownership of their special uh, like brick making technology. But I want to point out a couple of sort of ways of looking at this as an operational chain. Uh, and one is through the principle of hylomorphism, which we get from Aristotle, right? Hylomorphism uh, is the idea that uh, all matter, so all, all stuff is inert, and form shapes matter. So you have this lectern, and it used to be a tree. Uh, the tree is just inert, capable of being acted upon. Uh, it's put into a certain form by a controlling agent like a carpenter, uh, and voila, you have this lectern. Uh, that poses uh, a version of, uh, uh, of animacy or agency as the product of human control in a certain, certain sense. Uh, uh, allowing sort of for the passive actor, or, pa or not actor, but the passive subject in that dynamic to be the tree. Now, we know, because we might think in a little different way, that trying to build something out of wood is not that simple. Right? You could have a knot in the wood that forces you to have to work around it, or you could have um, a kind of grain that requires you to cut it in a certain way instead of another. And so the matter also is working against the form to sort of co-create itself. Uh, so hylomorphism wouldn't regard that as, as valid, the, the sort of pushing back of matter on the form that it's given. Uh, but if you look at uh, Gilbert Simondon's uh, idea of ontogenesis, you see it as a, as a co-constitutive process. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have, uh, this is injection plastic molding. So they're inje injecting like liquid plastic into these molds uh, and then stamping them uh, and it takes a form. So uh, 
uh, brick building itself uh, requires a relationship between the plasticity of the plastic, right? It's, it's moldability and the form it takes, whereby uh, one is sort of reinforcing the other by, um, I guess, sort of with the idea that uh, the, the brick you have is only a provisional version of that brick. Uh, and eventually it will decompose to be little nurdles that are at the bottom of the ocean, or um, eventually uh, this mold will no longer be quite as accurate. It's made uh, 120 million Lego bricks, and it's been retired because the precision of that mold is no longer quite what it once was. So uh, plastic is shaping the mold. The mold is shaping the plastic. Uh, so instead of thinking about something as fixed in time, you can think about it on a longer time scale as, as changing. So there are a number of people who have written about this. Uh, I like uh, Elizabeth Povinelli talks about it in terms of finitude or extinguishment. Uh, and I, I sort of like that model. But uh, let me just make a couple more points and then uh, we can get out. Uh, so one thing then is, is that the Crystal Palace helps us to show maybe that the important thing about modularity uh, is not its hierarchical nature, because its hierarchical nature ends up being somewhat problematic. Uh, it, it's that it's multidirectional. So in other words, modularity is a process, not a property. So we don't want to think of just the brick as being modular, and then another brick as being modular, and that additive nature creating a whole set of possibilities, because then we're limiting our scale of where the power lies beyond uh, just the brick itself and forgetting the operational chain from the, from the brick mold to uh, the infrastructure that gets it to uh, your living room uh, as a process uh, whereby change happens and it's possible. Now, if we operate from Simon's perspective, that hierarchy is a property of all complex systems. Uh, and it leads to efficiency, it leads to, or it, it, it capacitates mutability, uh, and it can accommodate endless growth, then we get a way of thinking that is very similar to the colonial thinking that can says, I, I'm entitled to come take over. I, we can continue doing that all around the planet, and uh, we can get really good at it, so it becomes essentially a, a formula, uh, and then we can make of every place that we want something different or make it more like us or whatever. Um, OK, so uh, let me just show you a couple more things. This was in the news. I saw it yesterday. Anybody happen to see this? So somebody created something called Oscar. Uh, these are cells grown from the, the scientist's body that produced a modular organism, like a living organism. Uh, this little black part up there uh, is like the brain. It's like electric pulses. And this body uh, it can be separated from the arms. And so you give it one arm, and the arm starts squirming. You give it the other arm, and then all of a sudden, it can autonomously move across the table. So this idea of modularity uh, is really endemic in how we think about scaling uh, human possibility uh, at the level of the body itself. And I think, yes, it's wonderful to think in terms of that way if you take the sort of, uh, you know, be a superhero and make your own worlds. But I think we want to be very careful about it insofar as the structure of modularity lends to these very sort of rapacious uh, ways of approaching it's re the relationship that, that any sort of modular system has with that which it encompasses. Uh, so I'll, uh, let me just do two more slides here. Uh, this is, um, what is it, XC? What, do you guys know these comics? I can't remember the name of them. But funny comics. Uh, when you take apart a Lego house and mix the pieces in the, into the bin, where does the house go? Well, it's in the bin. No, those are just pieces that, uh, that could become spaceships or trains. The house was an arrangement. The arrangement doesn't stay with the pieces, and it doesn't go anywhere else. It's just gone. So. Modularity as a kind of arrangement is an arrangement that helps maintain power and the, the fantasy of endless growth. Uh, but it can be fleeting. And I think in its possible fleetingness, uh, you see maybe a way to imagine a less hierarchical uh, approach to some of the critical work that we do, whether in media studies or elsewhere, 
Uh, so it's where whereby it's possible to rebuild worlds, it's possible to unbuild worlds, imagine new ones, uh, and change them, and so on. All right, that's it. All right, we're to the question and answer module. <laughs> Those are Robin Jensen jokes. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? Uh, thank you for this talk. This is really interesting. I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it. So hopefully this is like a real question here. But I'm seeing uh, implications here for capitalism as well. I'm wondering if that's something that you've explored as well. And maybe that's just you know considered under the idea of colonial thinking. So I know capitalism pulls into that. But that idea of like infinite growth, infinite ability to like keep pushing forward definitely falls into like a capitalistic endeavor. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, I allude to capitalism very fleetingly when I said I think of uh, capitalism as a power structure, and I'm trying to look at sort of the structure of power. So I would say the structure of capitalism is premised on a kind of modularity. Think about a big company uh, that might sell off one of its parts if it's not profitable enough, and then another person can take it, or a company can take it, and start it, make it its own, and then build from there. And so you have, or, or sort of the, the platformization of, of technology. So it used to be Facebook, then it became Meta. It used to be Google, then it became Alphabet because they keep getting bigger and bigger and having all these different modules underneath them. Uh, and that one might get sold off to a different one or sold off. And that ability to sort of break apart and cut losses uh, is part of the logic of capital that says we can grow endlessly because we can cut off the things that aren't working for us and place something new there. And that's also, I think, related to modernity itself, but that's a whole other thing. Uh, Susie. Thank you so much for an interesting presentation. And I appreciate that you were talking about material media, media a lot, because I think that's the real conversation we have to have. But mostly, we, we tend to find ourselves talking about represent, representational value and then you know, fighting a lot uselessly. So I, I appreciate that. And I keep thinking about language as a module. <laughs> I think that's the greatest example of module. And I, I almost think that since we cannot be modular being, maybe we are like growing our desire to build module outside our body in a world that we have to live in. And it seems like language does that exactly and when you talk about structure, yes, the language does structure of meanings. And we do have another higher form of module, which is narrative, right? And that carries structural power as well. So I don't know. There is a parallel what you are saying about this module in architectural sense, but also language in humanities. Have you ever thought about that? I have. That's a great question. Um, I think. One of the things that I go to, so is when you think about it from this sort of materialist media standpoint, uh, a lot of people who are doing that kind of work will draw these sort of epistemic epochs. So you have an oral culture that gives rise to a writing culture, which gives rise to a print culture, or to electronic, to digital, or whatever. You can map this differently depending on the extent to which you want to recognize that certain parts of the world missed out on some of these because they're in different time scales. Uh, but if you look at the shift from written culture, think about manuscript culture where you look at manuscripts and the writing can sort of drizzle down the page because one person who's the writer writes differently um, versus print culture. You begin to have uh, a discrete alphabet uh, and typeset blocks where there's a certain amount of space between the letters uh, and there's rules associated with that. So you read from right to left, top to bottom in English, or sorry, left to right, top to bottom in English. Uh, and those rules uh, are kind of modules in a sense, or uh, I would think of them more as part of a grammar than a rhetoric, I would say. Um, but uh, that's the, like, the extent to which I've, I've begun to think about that. But that helps me sort of get the materiality of it down when I think of those little metal type setting blocks. Probably. My question actually is a little bit uh, not not dissimilar from the question that Suhi just asked, as a matter of fact, because I was thinking that even if we challenge the hierarchical idea, you know, of, uh, of modules as an expression of hierarchy, for instance, 
the way you, you know the way you seem to be suggesting inciting other people to reimagine it, or I could be misunderstanding it. You know, is that there's still a, a, an intimation of a logic, right? So that modularity is an expression of a, maybe a different kind of logic, but there's a you know fixity. Even even thinking about the mutability, there's still a sort of like idea that there's these modules are kind of like you know the end of a process, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I'm just, you know, I'm thinking about trying to imagine about situations like thinking about evolution, for example, or maybe language is what made me think about that, or even human beings, right, or any organism, not just humans, right, mm -hmm. as modules, like, in, in, you know, in a way, sort of like the modules and mutations or changes among them create the system rather than modules being expression of the system, that maybe systems are expressions of the modules, right, that have the, there's a randomness or, organic feature related to that. So, you know, that was something that was pretty intriguing to me. And I was also thinking, like, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe just, uh, you know, um, thinking a little bit too much about ChatGPT or something about <laughs> AI, for example, right? These modules, right? That, you know, now have the capacity to, you know, mutate, to randomize, to recreate systems. So that, you know, it, it kind of interrupts an implicit, and maybe I'm misunderstanding too, linearity of like systems to module. Well, even I, if we rethink hierarchy. Yeah, that's great. So one thing I it got lost in this bundle of text uh, is that it's the, the mm -hmm. important thing is not that it's hierarchical, but that it's multi-directional. And, and that's what I'm asking. It's like, what, what does that mean? So I, I think you know it, it's insufficient to say that modularity just sort of oh here's modularity and let's like go with it uh, because it's always sort of accordioning in and out of itself. So the building is taken apart and repurposed, and it's never repurposed in quite the same way. Uh, and so uh, then you can get a history of how, say, your kids or you have played with Lego bricks, uh, that you can develop bodily habits about how you play, uh, or you can uh, create new ways based on sort of exposure to playing with friends who do it a different way. And so it's never just like unidirectional, I would say. Um, but I think one thing that's emphasized with the, the like, for example, the Lego branding of like, let's rebuild the world is the possibility. Like we're looking, we always get the, the, the 915 million number instead of like a single number. But you can also just as much take something apart as you can rebuild it. I don't know if that's helping, but I do see it as, as a process. Yeah, this was fantastic. I, I find this sort of thing so interesting. Thanks for the talk. So as you were going along, I was thinking about hierarchy <coughs> as inherent, but then not. And so when you got to multi-directional, I was like, cool. But now, I want to just press on the idea a little bit that multi-directionality is possible as an endpoint to modularity. And I'm going to say, I don't think it is. I think it ends up hierarchical inevitably. And maybe that's a, a limitation of my own thinking. But imagine that gift that the Lego worker is given after 20 years, right? Six perfect pieces in this box, which I thought was an amazing gift. I love everything about that. But that's, that's multi-directional, potentially. And it's, it's, it's at least in that moment not hierarchical. But then things start to happen. And whatever happens, I think, ultimately leads to hierarchy. So you take one piece out first, for example. But then maybe you stack another one on top, and maybe that one is now better. Right? So all this to say, am I, am I just not able to imagine a world without hierarchy? Or, or, or <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in you. I think you can imagine it. Um, I, I hear you. I'm trying to find a slide that might be useful for um, what I think might uh, address what you were talking about. Um, where is it? Sorry, it's kind of onerous going through all these. Um, it's possible I've already passed it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I might have passed it already. Oh, here it is. Um, so let's think of the temporality here. So with a, we talked about with a franchise, there needs to be a tie back to the, the sort of original or the, the brand identity that made it appealing. 
Uh, you can't stray too far from that. I mean, if you're like a Star Wars fan or something, and you see these new universes being built, it's, it's pitched rhetorically as a deepening of it. Oh, you're getting this whole side story that's not part of the main saga, uh, but it's, a, it's another thing, but it builds out that world, and you, your imagination grows. Um, that is a lateral moving, right? It's an expansiveness that um, maybe you could think of, I mean, maybe I'll be talk too specifically about the Star Wars universe, but you think of the Skywalker saga uh, with the main characters that you all know, and then you have these like offshoot shows now, like Andor is one, and then you have the Mandalorian one, um, and others. Uh, that's building out that universe but what's the relationship? Is it, is it like, well, Skywalker is number one, and then this is secondary? Maybe, but as the Andor series goes to like six seasons, it ends up being longer than all the main Star Wars movies combined, because now you have these individual shows that are like an hour long each. Uh, then maybe the hierarchy shifts some way. So the, the, if we're talking about, I, I, there's a couple parables, if you will, in, in this talk. Uh, so a lot of this is about the stories we tell. And I think it's possible to tell stories that imagine a new future while also seeing how the imagining of a new future shifts our understanding of the past in certain ways. And to me, that's a hopeful thing. And that's a destabilizing of hierarchy in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, but when it's sort of swallowed up by capital in the interest of maintaining profits, or not maintaining, but increasing profits, mm -hmm. then you're right back into the structure of modularity. This is endless growth, 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 to get to Tessa's thing. So that's where I, I alluded to kind of a tension that I feel. Like I think modularity is this great thing. At the same time, it gets incorporated as a logic to approach all kinds of hideous things. Yeah. And different people would see different kinds of hierarchy, even in that example, right? So somebody would look at the economics of it and say, Andor made this much, and the original series made that much, and so forth. So I'm with you. I think that we can imagine it multi-directionally, mm -hmm. and that might be appealing to us, mm -hmm. but I would say as it becomes increasingly material, there are hierarchies that will exist in that otherwise modular, multi-directional mm -hmm. world. But yeah, yeah, this is great. This is quite literal, Chris, so I, I don't know what to make of it exactly, but I kept thinking about with the modularity piece, um, what to make of Lego and how they have these really clear instructions about exactly how to make things. Where does that fit into? Yeah, so um, in the Lego world, they talk about free play versus structured play. And that kind of language gets incorporated into other like play literature, from what I understand. And um, Often that divide is associated with grown-ups and kids, uh, where adults do the free, the, sorry, the structured play, and the kids do the free play, um, and they end up also leading to different sort of endpoints. Uh, whereas in the sort of adult version of that, it's associated with display. Like I, in my office, I have a bunch of Legos that I built up on my sh shelf. Uh, whereas kids will then build something and then play with it. I don't play with a Lego anymore. I just build it. So. It's partly a marketing thing. It's partly uh, different habits of use. Uh, there's a, it's not that there's no creativity in following the instructions, because if you build like a really challenging set, it can be hard to follow. Um, but at the same time, totally different modality of interaction with it uh, than if you're just dumping out a bunch of Legos on the floor and trying not to step on them. Where does that fit into a world of game? So if you're given the instructions about how everything goes together, is that still modular? Sure, it's still modular. You're just following a, a, ser like a certain operational chain that leads you to a certain kind of output. Um, I think, though, that, again, to think about the process, like a lot of builds, well, you'll have one build, and like Assembly Square or whatever, or the Lego City or the Ninjago sets. I'm geeking out too much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, though you can build one set, follow those instructions, and then year or two later, they'll come out with a different set, and that will attach to that first set. And so it's, it's a continuation of that, separated by a certain time. So that's also the lateral spreading of the brand, that, like some of you are familiar with. Yeah. Natalie? Um, my question is somewhat similar. I 
Yeah, well, first, thank you. I think this is such an interesting talk. And I really like the connections you're making to infrastructures. And it made me think about um, what Brian Larkin talks about with sort of the poetics of infrastructure and how a road, for example, symbolizes like modernity, futurity, possibility. But at the same time, as it symbolizes all those things, it also is a specific limitation. Like it's, this is now the one road that we have. And so you may look at the road and think of all the possibility that it symbolizes, but it also is a limitation. And I feel like there's something similar happening with Legos, where like, yes, you have that 915 million, but there is also a certain limitation of the form. So I was wondering how you think about, yeah, that limitation. I mean, I'm, I'm not a proponent of endless growth. I am against it. So I think having that as a possibility is a really dangerous way of thinking. Um, because it ends up sucking everything into its maw that may not want to get sucked into it. And so I, at the same time, this is again that tension. You're getting right to the sort of problem that I'm trying to figure out. And I, I don't, I'm not versed enough in how to work my way out of it to have talked much about it. But I love the idea of endless like possibility, well, that's great. Uh, at the same time, I see that as being very problematic. So one thing just specifically to respond to that, I don't know Larkin's stuff on poetics of infrastructure, but it sounds awesome, you have to show me where to find it. Um, I think of Walter Ong's work about sort of the move to print culture. And I'm sort of outing myself as like Toronto school media theorist. Uh, but Ong talks about, uh, with typesetting, you begin to get this phenomenon of a blank page being this salient thing. It's totally, total, totally full of possibility, but also daunting, and yet also finite. You can only fit so much on that one blank page. That's similar to the road. It has this symbolic richness uh, that is infinite, and then you have this very finite sense of the pages eight and a half by 11 or whatever it is. That's what I thought. Thank you. Yeah. Grace, did you want to say something? I, it, I think it's similar to that, but I'm also thinking about like how Lego pieces have become so much more specific now. Like this is kind of cheating because we did this in a media society like three hours ago. Um, but the conversation <laughs> that I was having with a student about the Lego bonsai tree um, and all the little like pink frogs that are supposed to be the cherry blossoms, but like we don't look at those and go, oh yeah, those are cherry blossoms. We look at them and go, oh, they're pink frogs. And so, like, the, if there's anything to the way that, like, Lego brick making becoming more specific and more indexical um, as kind of limiting in this understanding of modularity. Yeah, so this is a great point, because I'm so glad you brought this up, because this is, again, that tension between uh, infinite and infinitude. Uh, okay. Lego, remember their principle, they begin with austerity. Like, we're making this, this bench. We want to save the scraps of wood to make something else. So from the start, uh, Lego has tried to be efficient with what the, the bricks it chooses to make. So it will repurpose what was a frog in one set to be a leaf on a tree in another set. And that's one of the Lego group's values, is not bringing new bricks to market uh, until you've identified that you can no longer create the worlds you want with the ones you already have. The great thing. So that's also, that's positioned as sort of, a con in the sort of Lego world, uh, that's positioned as a constraint uh, that, one of these sort of constraints that capacitates world building because you have to be more creative to think about it. Um, there's a great movie that I'll plug on this very phenomenon called The Five Obstructions. It has nothing to do with Lego, but it, it takes a short film and it asks uh, the director to remake it five different ways with different constraints that uh, the new director has imposed. And it's a totally different film, even though it's basically the same story. Anyway, it, it's this idea that constraints help you be more creative rather than having endless freedom. Just one recommendation. Please. Michael Rothberg, he is a memory scholar, and he's uh, developing the notion of multi-directional memories. And impulse is very similar to you. He sees the hierarchical structure in memories, Jerusalem paradigm. He thinks that that takes us nowhere. 
and he want to see different qualities in memory, like anachronistic qualities. Something could be negative, but then in his eye, in his new paradigm, it could be contribute to multi-directional memory concepts. So I think you and him can be a buddy. All right, thank you. I'll have to chat with you and get that. Thank you, everybody. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Chris.